This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and Jeff Fife. We're going to get you ready for the ACC teams in the NCAA tournament. We might talk some other NCAA tournament uh, things as well. But Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Good to have you back in the Shenandoah Valley after chilling in New York, having a good old time at the Barclays Center. I always enjoy when you come back from the tournament having done one or two of those with you and, uh, and then watching all of your videos just a free press Facebook page that got dropped with the uh, interviews with some of the players and, and some of the uh, interesting questions and commentary that you had. I love the behind the scenes. So, you know, before we break into the bracket itself, and we're recording this on a Thursday afternoon, some of those games are done already. Um, but uh, curious just sort of about your experience as the ACC tournament. I mean, it's still got to be rewarding to stand on that hardwood as the blue and orange confetti is flowing down around you. Uh, with confetti here at the studio, at the podcast studio that you scooped up. Um, I was curious because I couldn't tell from behind the scenes and they cut us off on the television for a boxing match. Um, if Tony Bennett was actually going to scale up a ladder and cut a net or what it would take to get him there. What are some of the behind the scenes or really specifically on that moment? Then I'll ask a little bit more about the rest of the tournament. What was that like with Virginia celebrating on the uh, on the court of the Barclays? Yeah, you know the the last uh, few seconds of a game like that. You know, in, in the last few years that I've been there for the final game, it's never been a one or two point game, so you kind of know thirty seconds to go at least, if not more, uh, who the team's going to be that's going to win the game. Uh, you know, so it was clear Virginia was making their free throws. Uh, Carolina missed a shot when they were down eight. Uh, DeAndre Hunter gets the rebound. You know, all of a sudden I turn into and Crystal, who Crystal Graham, who was with me covering the tournament as well. We we go from you know working the game mode to now we got to work the championship mode, and uh, it it does happen quickly. The confetti starts falling uh, as the last seconds are counting down. Uh, you know, I know Crystal was getting some pictures. She got a few really good pictures uh, from from our courtside seats um, uh, of the celebration. You know, I think there was one with. Kyle Guy and uh, uh, Isaiah Wilkins uh, embracing, and there was another with DeAndre Hunter, and I can't remember who that was. Maybe Mamadi Diakite. Uh, but yeah, it happened so quick. Uh, you know, they they quickly turn. You know, all, all of a sudden there's all these media people on the floor, and uh, we turned around and did a, a try to do a, a Facebook live to show some of that moment. Uh, but they set up a stage on the floor. I mean, this happened so it just happened so fast. They set up a stage on the floor. John Swafford, the ACC commissioner, comes out, uh, presents the trophy. Jay Billis does a live interview. He talks to Kyle Guy. Uh, then after after Kyle Guy was named the, uh, the tournament MVP, and then uh, yeah, then they get ladders out and they start you know, climbing up and cutting down the ladders, and everybody cuts one one uh, one strand of the net. And Tony Bennett was last. Uh, he seemed to have to be cajoled to get up the ladder, uh, but he did. And uh, you know the loudest cheer. The, the thing that remarked me too. As as different guys are up there getting up the ladder, going back up and down the ladder, I started looking around, just panning around. For a second, I wanted to sink it in, you know, let it soak in a little bit. Uh, and there were a lot of people hanging around, you know, very few people. I guess the Carolina fans left, but there was a lot of blue and orange. There were ten thousand people, if, if not more, staying around for this whole probably fifteen twenty minutes after the game. Uh, so Tony cuts the net down, and then all of a sudden. I mean, I'll fast forward. I went back to the locker room. Uh, the locker room opens up as soon as the coach and the two players who were assigned to go talk to the main media folks leave the locker room. Uh, everybody, all, all the other players and assistant coaches stay back in the locker room. The locker room's been considered open. We can go. That's where I wanted to go. In the, in the, in the main interview room, that's kind of boring. You know, that's like the, you can see that on YouTube or Facebook Live or whatever else. I wanted to go back and talk to the, uh, to the, to the guys one-on-one as much as possible. And, uh, yeah, the locker room was was uh, was a, a scene, man. It was a scene. Uh, Jason Williford left. Uh, one of the reporters sitting next to me asked, uh, you know, why are you leaving? He said, I don't want to be in there right now. It's a little, a little crazy. Uh, water bottles being sprayed everywhere. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're college kids. They enjoyed they, they enjoyed the hard work. It was the fruits of labor. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, it all happened so fast. I mean, I, I come out of there. The locker room's open for 30 minutes. I was in there for most of that 30 minutes. Walk out, and they're already tearing down the guard. The, the Barclays Center. There was a game the next night. Uh, the, New York, the, the New Jersey, uh, I guess the Brooklyn Nets were playing the uh, Sixers the next night. They were already tearing everything down and getting ready for the next game. So it happens that quick. Though. 
any of uh, I found it interesting, Kyle Guy sort of chuckling at your question about do you have to to be the tournament MVP officially get a dunk in? <laughs> um, any other interesting questions, uh, answers, responses? Who was the most interesting? You get a lot of time with the with the Virginia kids, and I'm sure they take a look at half of that locker room and don't recognize faces, so a little bit more comfortable the ones that are consistently following and tra- uh, following the team and asking the Q and A. You know, who jumped out at you that wasn't a Cavalier uh, as one of the more personable interviews or questions? You know, what about some of the other visiting locker rooms? Actually, I didn't go to any other locker rooms. I just went to the Virginia locker room. Only Virginia. I went to the Louisville locker room after after their first game when they played uh, Florida State. And so I should correct myself there uh, because I wanted to – because that was the team playing Virginia in the quarterfinals. And I wanted to get a sense of what the – for my game preview uh, of UVA Louisville, I wanted to get a sense of what the Louisville kids were saying. Uh, part of that was uh, they gave bulletin board materials to Virginia, which is not the smartest thing to do when you get ready to play the number one team in the country. There were several players back there talking about how Virginia was scared of them. Uh, the, the next day, so fast forward to Virginia wins the game by 17 points. Uh, Ty Jerome, first kid I get to go up to and talk with, uh, question. So did you hear any of those comments? Yeah, we heard him. Uh, uh, and, and his first answer was, uh, I wish I, I could remember exactly what he said, but he said, that was pretty dumb, was the, the, the essence of that message. And then he said, let me change it. Let me just say no comment. <laughs> Smart kid. So the two important questions, maybe the most important. This is, feels like a Tony Kornheiser type question because <laughs> you have the guys from the Olympic coverage on the Tony Kornheiser show, and he doesn't talk to them at all about – uh, the Olympics, he talks about accommodations. Um, the food and the swag. So what was the swag this year? What was the swag? Yes. Uh, what was the swag? We got, oh, we got a really nice notebook, this, which will be something Crystal's already taken out to business meetings. Uh, we each got a really nice, and when I say notebook, I mean like a binder kind of notebook, and I don't have it here in front of me, but it's, trust me, it's really nice. Now we have in past years, I've got my, my, uh, computer bag here and you know you get some years get sweatshirts and that kind of thing uh but the nice computer bag also part of the reason that they didn't give you like this you know a really nice computer bag type thing is because we in brooklyn uh they gave us a 50 dollar voucher for lyft you know the the uber competitor uh because you know when you're in greensboro or charlotte it's easy to park near the arena and there ain't no parking near the barclays arena you know in anywhere in new york so uh, they gave us uh, those vouchers th- to use for our transportation back and forth to our hotel. Uh, so those were very those were very handy. Uh, we had those, e- those last year as well. Very helpful. Uh, but the food, yeah, the food was the food is always great. There's way too much of it uh, for for the liking. You know, it, so when you see your average sports writer at a game and you see how hefty they all are, I was going to say the word fat. Uh, like I used to be, I was a big man, big man a few years ago. There's a reason because there's all this stuff. That, not only the meals they feed you, which are catered like gourmet meals, but then the snacks in between. You know, yeah, there's unlimited ice cream, un- unlimited popcorn, uh, Starbucks coffee. Uh, you know, that kept me awake the, the two nights of the four days. You know, four games a day. Uh, the coffee was very helpful, but uh, yeah, it's it's absurd uh, how well we're treated. Not to mention the courtside seats. I sat underneath the basket for. The first four days, the last day I sat center court, third row, uh, hard to complain about that. Uh, I got my hands – I was going to say this. I was thinking about this last night when I was working out the wide jab, so I'm, I'm glad I – before before I missed this opportunity. I did get my hands on a loose ball. Um, it was in the um, second game of Thursday, which was Clemson-Boston College. Uh, shot got blocked out of bounds, um, comes right towards me, you know, catch it. I touched that basketball, and I held it in my hands. It felt like minutes. It was probably less than a second. But, you know, I played basketball at the Y. I shot some last night at the Y. Uh, that basketball felt nice. The basketballs they play with are incredible. <laughs> I, I'll have to think of myself in that, like, seven-tenths of a second that I had that ball in my hand was, I can make some shots with this basketball. This this is nice leather. <laughs> one of the things you missed being on courtside, seeing the television coverage, is one of the – commentators went off on the basketball and one shot that was, and I can't remember who the Virginia competitor was, but it just stuck on the back of the iron and then fell in. Yeah. And he was talking about the, the, the brand of basketball and the, the, the feel of it. And it's just a different type it of felt nice. 
nice. And I should also say, you might have seen this on Twitter, Jeff, if you were following or anybody out there listening. Uh, there was a really controversial play, not the one with Grayson Allen. That was on the court. Uh, in the Notre Dame-Virginia Tech uh, Virginia Tech game, uh, you might remember this play as I describe it. Chris Clark throwing Matt Farrell out of bounds. Yeah. He landed on. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he landed on my foot, uh, continued down. He knocked some computers over to my right. Uh, they were fixing things up because uh, computers and drinks and coffees and everything else askew the table. The, the, the banner went down. Uh, and, uh, you know, all I could think was uh, he stepped on my foot. I hope he didn't break his ankle. Like Because, you know, when a guy falls on a foot, you know, that, that could be a way to sprain your ankle or whatever else. He gets up. So I was asked after the game because Clark said after the game, he was one of the guys from Virginia Tech being interviewed by the main group of the media. And he said, no, it was, he, he acted. It was, it was a, you know, it was acting part of his job. No, it happened five feet from me. He threw him. Yeah. And that was the critical play of that game. I mean, that ended Virginia Tech's run in the ACC, the short lived run. I mean, they were down, what, 17? I don't know how big that lead Notre was. Notre Dame was down 21 at the worst. Uh, by that point, but with that play, it had gotten to eight. But, you know, when you're coming back in a game, what can happen, and often does happen, is you put so much energy into the comeback, and when you're down 21, that's a huge comeback. So you, you can have a couple different runs, cutting it to eight, and they've missed a couple shots Notre Dame had. So it was like, oh, man, you know, you know, if you're rooting for Notre Dame, you're thinking maybe maybe the run's petered out, and Virginia Tech gets one basket. It gets back above double digits. And, you know, you're going to look up if you're Notre Dame and say, man, they cut it from 21 to eight, now 13 again. So he throws him out of bounds. It was a it was a common foul and a technical foul. They get the two uh, the two free throws on the tech. They made the basket on the next possession. All of a sudden, a game that could have been ten is four. So yeah, that was a key part of the second part of Notre Dame's you know lengthy and and, and mount, you know mountainous comeback. To have to come back. You're watching that live and having Matt Farrell fall on you. I'm listening to it on my phone while shopping at Walmart. <laughs> well, and, and I'll say this too. This is fortune for me. Uh, I was um, writing a, a game story from the game before, uh, and you're sitting courtside because you're not courtside seats, but you're also writing on your computer. I happened to look up like about ten seconds before because whatever play was going on, I watched that play, kind of just like stretching my brain out a little bit, and then that happens in front of me. Because otherwise, he just falls into me. And I don't even know what's happening. I'd be, you know, it'd be like. A, getting hit by a, by a car when you're not paying attention on the road or whatever else. Um, and so uh, someone from back home, actually Seth Meganson, who uh, has, has worked with us as an, as an intern and done some writing for us, uh, within seconds of this play happening, I see on Twitter a screenshot of me looking up at the play, looking up as Farrell's getting pushed into me. Uh, and so uh, fortunately I wasn't picking my nose. I wasn't doing anything else when ESPN's cameras for that important second of a game. I mean, that important, two or three seconds of the game. Uh, you know, I was actually not typing. I was paying attention. I wasn't drinking coffee. I wasn't picking my nose. I was watching intently basketball. Mm. I looked you, like I was working, yeah. Those people, you know, will think that being able to sit courtside at the ACC tournament, and it is, it's an honor and a, a lot of fun, but it's also exhausting. It's a grind. And at the end of that, I mean, I got to, uh, I was blessed to go to two years ago just to the championship game in North Carolina, but 2013, we did the whole kit and caboodle together and when Miami won it. And uh, I did not realize how exhausting watching basketball four games a day for, you know, for two or three days in a row and then as it whittled down is, you know, anything jump out at you? I mean, obviously, one of the, you got to watch Duke and Carolina head to head. You got to see the Grayson Allen hip check. You got to see the Virginia Tech just god awful, um, you know, choke job yeah what what games besides the ones virginia were in stood out to you what were some of your most memorable non-uva experiences well before i even say that i want to say quickly that if jeff fife folks who are listening out there who don't know jeff for jeff fife to admit to being exhausted at anything is amazing this man has energy seven days a week 24 hours a day but it does it wears you down um you know the my first thought would be having seen these teams in person very much up close. Uh, I was very surprised that, that Louisville, one, was even on the bubble. They didn't make the tournament. Seeing them up close, they're such a physical, athletic team. Holy crap, that team lost 13 games this year. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of people out there talking about what a great job David Padgett did to get them to that stage. If Rick Pitino was coaching that team, 
they'd be a four or five seed in the NCAA tournament, if not even higher than that. Uh, there's a lot of talent on that team, and they didn't make the tournament. That was just, you know, th- th- when they beat Florida State on Wednesday, I mean, that's a good, that's a good team. Uh, you know, and they lost by 17 to Virginia, but that game was a four-point game with about eight minutes to go. So, you know, they – and that's, you know, number one team in the country. You, you know, you don't fault that. They're playing their second game in two days, Virginia playing their first game. Uh, I was also surprised Notre Dame didn't get a bit and that Syracuse did get a bit. And, the, the, you know, coming back from, from New York on uh, Sunday, I didn't get to watch the selection show, but I did get to uh, read the interview where the, the, the attorney uh, selection committee chair talked about Syracuse was the last team in and Notre Dame was the first team out. Notre Dame would have made it if Davidson didn't get the bid. Um, having watched them up close and in person, there's no way I would put no- Syracuse anywhere near. I, mean, they, I know they won last night. Uh, I wouldn't have put them anywhere near this field. Uh, seeing them in person, seeing Notre Dame in person, Notre Dame with Bonzi Colson, I would not want to play them uh, in an NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, they're a, they're a, you know, if, if Colson's there all year long, they're a four or five seed. So, uh, you know, other impressions. Uh, you know, Virginia Tech. Yeah, they they did they did crap the bed there at the end. But uh, you know, I, I look at them. They're playing tonight uh, as we're recording this podcast. At least Alabama. You know, they're a team that if they win and theoretically will play Villanova. You know, if they can get past Radford, right? Uh, <laughs> Radford. That's a big. Sure. Radford will give them a little bit of a test. I think we're not going to give them the Kansas test. <laughs> the Kansas pin test. Yeah. I'm just hoping to stay within thirty. Yeah. So so you know. Um, so if, if, if Nova plays Tech in the second round, Tech's beat a number one seed this year. They beat Virginia in, in Charlottesville. So, uh, you know, that's that's an intriguing matchup uh, potentially for, for Villanova. Uh, but don't overlook Radford. Uh, there was a <laughs> don't sleep on Radford. Great tweet. Uh, someone tweeted at Marty Smith. You know Marty Smith, right, the ESPN guy from uh, from, from uh, Southwest Virginia. Uh, someone tweeted at uh, uh, Marty Smith. So, Marty, what ha- how many beers do you drink? If it happens to be Radford versus Virginia Tech in the second round, he said all of them. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been on the floor for Radford, Virginia Tech. Those are – yeah, that won't happen. But <laughs> it, it's good to dream. So while we're in a jovial mood, let's talk about the other uh, viewing opportunities at the uh, at the ACC tournament. Who are the best cheerleaders this year? Because that's critical. You and I have had this discussion multiple oh, times. Yeah, yeah, we, we Usually the Florida that. schools are the tough ones to beat. Florida State was still by far number one. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, and, and because my wife was covering the tournament with me, I had to, like, when I was tweeting out these messages, I had to be careful. I would say the students leading the organized cheers for this particular school are really good at their jobs. That was that was the signal. But, yeah, Florida State, you, you know, yeah, far and away. Uh, you know, and they were smart because, like, they in Miami, Miami was second, not a close second, but they were second. They only brought their dance squad. You know, the, the schools who tried to bring half dance squad and half – you know, cheerleading squad, which includes the guys who throw the girls up in the air and that kind of thing. Commit to one or the other. You know, go, go, just go with what you got and go with it. You know, run, run hard with it. You know, the, the Florida State though, I don't, I don't even care if they have the other kind of cheerleaders. That the the, the group they brought, they were, they were, uh, they were top notch. It's a shame Louisville knocked Florida State out as early as they did. Yeah, <laughs> Louisville, Louisville didn't have any fans there. Their cheerleaders and their band played their little songs and everything else, and nobody cared. And then the Florida State group got out there. Nobody, people who weren't even watching the games, are like all of a sudden, hey, Florida State, man. You know? Florida State, we <laughs> love those Seminoles. I should also point out too, where we were sitting this year, being under a basket meant literally three feet behind me was the band. And so Crystal came down. Crystal, the first couple of days, um, her seats were elevated, kind of like a JPJ. You know, the media section of JPJ were not on the floor. Uh, we're halfway up the first section. She was at the, actually the back part of the first section the first two days. And then she got to sit center court for the last three days, center court, third row. And that's where I joined her for the final game. But she sat down with me very briefly a couple times on those first two days with the band right behind me, you know, um, and couldn't take a few seconds of it. Wow. I had – what would that be? Uh, Twelve games of it, twelve or thirteen games of that behind me. It got to a point where I didn't even hear it, you know. And that and she she even took a picture, and I'm not sure if it ended up on on Twitter or not. The when the Trump because the, the trombonists, of course, they're in the front of the band. The trombones were like inches from my head, <laughs> you know. That's how close the bands were. Um, and of course, all the band kids in between the songs. Uh, band kids, you know. No offense for those who are listening out there who were band kids in high school, but that I, I really understand the American Pie um, 
you know, and then there was that one time when I was in band camp. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's across the board. All I guess I can't think of how many schools were sitting behind me. Maybe five or six because you know the other end had the other band. Um, the the stupidest, dumbest, non basketballist comments you can imagine. An entire game, and they think they're clever. I mean, because these are all college kids. The Duke kids are probably the worst, and they're supposed to be the smartest. But just dumb, asinine comments all game long. You almost wanted them to play music because when they were playing music, that meant they couldn't talk. Um, so you know, such is life. Right? So twelve hours, <laughs> lots of band time. That's lots a beautiful thing. Oh so, my God. So let's get to the game and really more the transition into the NCAA tournament in Virginia. And two days ago, we get the uh, news releases that DeAndre Hunter, uh, I don't know what's more amazing that, you know, he makes eight out of ten free throws at the tail end with a broken wrist at ACC. And and they said he didn't talk about it in the media, but I look at your videos on Facebook and he talked about his wrist being uncomfortable. So he was addressing it. He play, he he got injured in the Clemson game. If you think about the play in the first half, uh, he, he was driving hard from the baseline to the basket and got knocked down by Elton Thomas, the center for Clemson, and landed face first. You might remember that play. I remember saying the reporter sitting next to me actually said, you know, I've seen a lot of guys get hurt on that kind of play. And you're thinking about the head because, you know, he fell face first. Bracing with his wrist is what the issue was. But he played the whole second half of that game. He didn't play the whole second half. As a bench guy, he played probably 10 or 12 minutes in the second half. He played 20 minutes in the championship game with a broken left wrist. And he yeah. was 8 for 10 from the line in the last minute. And looked off um, in the beginning. He until he didn't that... even shoot free throws in, in warm-ups because his wrists were hurt. So, and he played. He played. It's amazing, and I, and I, I, you know, you get a lot of the woe is me on the Cav Nation, but not as much as you would think. You know, you know, how does Virginia react? Who gets the minutes? How do you respond? And how does this ultimately impact Virginia's chances at winning the national championship? It, it'll have an impact. I mean, look at it today. I don't know the kid's name, but Kansas' starting center was out today, and he might be out this weekend too. Averages thirteen point seven points a game, like nine something rebounds a game. He's out today. He was out. He'll be out probably on Saturday as well. And look, Kansas, you know, was down ten in the first half. Um, you know, for Virginia, you know, you, you never want this kind of thing to happen. But if it had to happen, and it has happened in the past years, we've seen um, famously Anthony Gill went down to a sprained ankle in the second half of a Michigan State Sweet 16 game. I'm among a lot of people who think that that doesn't happen. That team goes to the Final Four, maybe wins a championship. Uh, but he does, and he lo- Virginia loses by one point in that game. You don't have a time to adjust in that situation. I mean, you know, Michigan State was a team that had two really good bigs. We lost one of our good bigs, and you don't have to, you don't have time or personnel to adjust to that. So if this is going to happen, happen on the Monday as you're getting ready for the tournament. You won't play till Friday. Uh, that's plenty of time for Tony and his staff one to come up with their plan, whatever the plan is, and then two to get the kids ready for the plan. Uh, we saw this happen earlier this season when Nigel Johnson, another bench player, another key bench player, went down to the three-game suspension. Uh, what Virginia did then, they had a, they didn't tell us until 30 minutes before tip-off, but they knew three days before that they were going to suspend Nigel Johnson. And uh, they had plenty of time to get Marco Anthony ready. Marco Anthony goes out in, in that Louisville game, and he you know, plays 18 minutes, scores 10 points. So now, what I think will happen here, I mean, there's a couple scenarios. I'll go with the scenario I don't think will be the scenario. Well, the, I'll go through two scenarios I don't think will be the scenario. Then I'll go to the one I think will be the scenario. The first scenario that won't be is Jay Huff. As much as folks listening to this podcast now 20-plus minutes in who are UVA fans want to hear me say, Chris Graham thinks Jay Huff will get 20 minutes now. No, that's not going to happen. Jay Huff gets minutes if the game's 25-point lead with two minutes to go. Jay Huff will get minutes against... You know, the one seed. I mean, the 16 seed. <laughs> yeah, and, and those will be garbage minutes. You know, God love the kid, and next year he's going to be a really valuable player for this team. But this year he's not had any significant minutes since November. Maybe maybe December. I, I, I looked at him. He didn't have any significant. He played in the pit game a few minutes, but everybody played the pit game. Uh, and so, no, you don't go from no minutes all season, all significant games season long, and, and all of a sudden in the NCAA tournament, you get minutes. We know the kid can score. We don't know what the kid can do in terms of defense. This team wins games with defense, not by outscoring teams. So Jay Huff, write that off your list. Wipe it off the erase board. Second scenario would involve Marco Anthony uh, maybe you know getting back in the mix. And we know Anthony can do something. He had 18 valuable minutes against Louisville. Then he played five against Florida State in you know not in a mop-up role. That was a close game. So there was no mop-up role in that game. 
Then he played in the pit game, and that's it. So after Louisville, he played twice, once in garbage time minutes. I don't think Anthony is going to get minutes, uh, you know, again, you know, tomorrow night maybe just because of potential for, for garbage time. Uh, but here's the scenario I think does happen. Uh, I think you see Mami Diakite, who already gets a lot of minutes. He gets 15 to 20 minutes a night. I think you see him get his regular 15 to 20. Maybe they try to stretch him out a little bit. His issue is the fouls. He averages 5.7 fouls per 40 minutes, almost double what the next guy on the team averages. Um, he's athletic as heck. He can score in a post. He had two 10-point games in the ACC tournament. We know the kid can do it. Is can he can he stay on the floor? He has two fouls walking off the bus. So can you, can the kid stay on the floor for long enough? Um, I think if he can, he's he's a solution. If he can't, and you have to presume that he can't, he'll he'll get a couple fouls and have to go out early. I think what happens is Devin Hall plays stretch four, which is not a role that um, is unfamiliar to him. Uh, played a lot last year, played a lot two years ago for this team. Uh, and what happens as with him as a stretch four, essentially Virginia plays three guards, two forwards. There's really no center. There's no defined point guard. We all call Ty Jerome the point guard. He's Okay, so for purposes of putting guys in slots, he's the point guard. Any of the three guards bring the ball to the floor. Any of the three guards initiate the offense. The other two guards, whoever's not initiating the offense, runs off screens. The two, the four and five set screens, uh, and they're constantly setting screens. I challenge you to watch a UVA offensive possession and, and just watch Jack Salt and Isaiah Wilkins on those possessions, and you'll see what they do is they, they're constantly moving either either baseline or, or foul line uh, to, to set screens for Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome, or, or, or Devin Hall's case maybe. So Hall goes into that role where he's a screen setter. Now, where the bigs get their points, you don't see Jack Salt do this because Jack Salt's range is about two feet. But Wilkins can pop out and hit a 12 to 15 foot jumper. He can hit a three. He's hit some threes this year. Diakite can certainly hit that jumper. He can hit the, you know, the 10, 12 footer. He can score in the post. Uh, we know DeAndre Hunter, is he can score pretty well on the floor. Um, so where Hall will get his baskets is when he sets the screen, if, if the defender cheats too much on the screen, he pops out or he rolls to the basket. Defensively, Hall is 6'5", about 220. He's, he's stout enough to play, especially the first game. You and UNBC is a small team. Uh, they'll play one 6'9 guy. Um, they'll play four guys between 5'7 and 6'6". Six, six. They actually have two bench guys who were 6'9 or 6'10, but they average total 40 minutes. They basically play a four-guard, one, one center lineup. Hall could easily, in the first game, that's the solution. Hall plays uh, uh, in the four, and then you bring... Nigel Johnson in for the minutes, uh, and then you bring Diakite in for minutes. I think a seven-man rotation is likely what you're going to see here. Not an, you, Virginia's been playing eight-man rotation. I think you see it cut back one to seven. Um, in a pinch, maybe Anthony gets in, but I think Anthony gets three or four minutes, five minutes, if there's foul trouble in game two and beyond. As we record, uh, Miami's in a battle with Loyola. Uh, Duke has advanced. Um, the ACC – Gets eight nine. teams in, nine, nine teams in. Um, how you know? How do you see them faring? I mean, in my bracket, I'm nuts. I mean, I got Duke and Virginia in the championship. At one point, I got NC State and Clemson meeting, um, and NC State's getting tipped off now, and it has a slight, you know, is down to Seton Hall in the early part of the first half as we're recording. You know, where do you see the ACC landing in comparison? Because you keep hearing people talking about the Big Ten. And uh, the Big Least, um, you know, who comes out as the uh, greatest winning percentages of any of these uh, big uh, power conferences? And do you think it is an ACC team in the end that wins it all? And I think it certainly can be. UVA and Duke have to be, even with UVA's injury, have, they have to be top contenders for the uh, for Final Four slots and a championship team slot. Um, you know, Carolina could be on the edge of that. I'm not sure Carolina is a Final Four team this year, though. They beat Duke um, in, in, in the uh, ACC tournament semifinals in an in you know, interesting game. They had a 16-point lead and then couldn't score uh, until foul shots with three seconds left. Let Duke back into that game in lots of ways. Carolina played a perfect ACC championship game and lost by eight. And that's no offense to them. That's because Virginia was that much better that night, has been that much better all season. Now we'll see how they play without Hunter. But Carolina needed to cut down on – the turnovers they did from the first game of back in January with Char in Charlottesville, they still scored points with second chance points. They shot 10% better from the field. Luke May had six points in the loss in Charlottesville in, in January. He had 20 points. 
they did what they wanted to do and still lost. But they beat Duke. Uh, and if I think Duke's a Final Four team, that get, tells me that Carolina's got the potential to be a Final Four team. What I saw out of Carolina, though, in four days, they played two great games, losing, beating Duke and losing to Virginia. I wasn't as impressed with their first two games, even though they, you know, they won those games by double digits eventually. You know, and what I see out of that Carolina team is, you know, and it's, no, it's certainly no fault to Roy Williams. He had a lot of inside presence last year. They don't have much inside presence this year. Luke May is is, is by title a six nine power forward, but he does his best damage really, you know, twelve feet out. You know, mid range jumpers and then three point jumpers. He doesn't score a lot in the post, and they don't really have anybody who scores a lot in the post. So. This Carolina team's not like the last two that played the last game of the season. Um, they can get there if the brackets work out well enough, and I think the fact they're in Xavier's region could work out. I, you know, I didn't pay close attention to their, their games leading up to that, you know, second, third round games that could lead up to a, a potential matchup with Xavier. I like them if they get to the game against Xavier. Uh, you know, I'm not as sold on NC State. They don't play enough defense for me. I, great job by Kevin Keats to get that team to the tournament. I don't think they play enough defense to get past this weekend. Clemson doesn't have enough offense to get past this weekend. Um, you know, they really gritted it out a season without Dante Grantham, but I just don't see them getting, you know, to the Sweet 16. Um, Syracuse, I mentioned earlier, I don't think they should even be in the tournament. They won the play-in game last night, so they're still playing. Um, who else am I leaving out here? Miami, I'm not surprised that as we're talking that they're behind. Uh, you know, they, they sort of hit their wall. After the Carolina game, the, the game in Chapel Hill where they hit the three to win it at the buzzer, that seemed to be – I mean, they, they beat BC the game before that. You know, that was a little mini rally for them. They've been struggling for a couple weeks leading up to that. I think they may have played their best basketball this year, unfortunately, for Jim Laird and his group. Florida State, I think they could easily lose today. Florida State is really, really, you know, running on fumes right now. So, you know. We're leaving one team out. Oh, Virginia Tech. <laughs> is there a middle block there? Is there a middle block? There? I don't have them getting past Alabama. Um, They're the only ACC team I gave no love to, but that's not a surprise. You know, Alabama's got Colin Sexton, maybe the best individual player in this tournament, and I know I'm saying that Marvin Bagley's there and DeAndre Ayton's there, and DeAndre Ayton may play Virginia if both teams get that far in the Sweet 16. Sexton's going to be a special point guard in the NBA. Uh, he'll be a tough guard for Virginia Tech. You know, they've they've played well down the stretch. They're a good shooting team. Always have been this season. Uh, top five in the country shooting percentage-wise. They didn't start winning, though, until they started playing defense. Now, the hard part's going to be for them. Uh, can Jerome Robinson – or uh, Justin Robinson. There are two Robinsons in the ACC, and I'm getting them all mixed up. Jerome Robinson is the Boston College kid. Uh, first team all ACC. Uh, Justin Robinson, second team all ACC. Can he stay out of foul trouble? Because he, he gets a couple early fouls in that game, and that game can get ugly for Virginia Tech early. Um, I would not be surprised, though. I think that's a pick em game. They don't get past Villanova, though. Uh, they'll make it interesting against Villanova, but they don't get past the weekend. And I don't see uh, the Terrapins in anywhere, an old ACC friend. That brings me great pleasure as much as it did to see Virginia Tech drop uh, against Notre Dame. Maryland just sucks. Maryland, yeah, and, uh, you know, there there's a lot of things about that. John Feinstein, a guy that I normally respect the heck out of, wrote a column a few weeks ago about how the ACC misses Maryland. No, we don't. What? Because we don't have another, <laughs> another team to beat? Is that what we're missing? Is another team to play on Tuesday in the ACC tournament opening day? Uh, no, we don't miss Maryland. We certainly don't miss their fan base. <laughs> no, gosh. That was one of the great my younger sons. Is one of his first really well put together sentences was, um, wow, Maryland fans are more obnoxious than Hokies. I was like, brilliant. <laughs> you kid, you definitely came from the DNA pool. Yeah. Yes. You know, um, Maryland fans are so bad, they made me feel sorry for J.J. Reddick. Mm. That is hard, but they actually had me – that that famous game where they're cursing J.J. Reddick the whole time, and Dick Vitale got upset. They're holding up pictures of J.J.'s little sister, talking about <laughs> how they wanted to have sex with her. I mean, if, if Maryland fans can make you feel sorry for Duke. Yeah, then they're bad. They they're bad. They're bad, yeah. So does Virginia win it all? Does you made, Virginia win it all? You made a bold prediction they could make it to the Final Four at the beginning of the season. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. What happens now? We're three weekends out. You know, does uh, do you think Virginia's got the horses without DeAndre to win the national title? I think they do, and of course, I'm, I got orange and blue colored glasses on when I say this. So factor that out. But you know, for those listening this far in and, and wondering, you know, because it's been a couple of days, we've had ch- we've had a chance to calm down, get off the ledge, whatever else. Uh, but are we just fooling ourselves into thinking that, or is it true? Okay, what I go with this is there are five positions on the floor, 40 minutes per position. There's 200 minutes of game time. For them. 
DeAndre Hunter averaged about 20 minutes a game. You know, do we miss – his 20 minutes a game were pretty good. I mean, he's, he averaged 10.8 a game in ACC play. Uh, he was the sixth man of the year in the ACC for a reason. He plays good defense. But if we're replacing those minutes, who are we replacing them with? A few more out of Diakite, who had 10 points in each of the first two ACC games for Virginia. He had nine points uh, in each, each of the last two regular season games. So he's also averaging around 10 a game in ACC play, at least, you know, the most recent action. Um, give him a few more minutes. We'll give you – know, if we can figure out a way to have Devin Hall play 45 minutes in the game instead of just 40. But, you know, a few more minutes for Devin Hall. And what it really means is a few more minutes for Nigel Johnson. Really, that's the guy. You, you, you get five to eight more minutes out of Diakite. Johnson only played 10 minutes in the ACC title game. Give him five to eight more minutes. You've pretty much got the minutes made up from, from Hunter. He's a dynamic player. He can score back to the basket. He can score from 10 feet out, driving past a guy. He can score uh, mid-range. He can score... Three point range when you, when a team zones you, they don't want to zone you when he's in there, uh, and because he makes them he makes them pay for that. Devin Hall can do those things, and and Devin Hall has done them all year long now. So the question to me is not do we replace DeAndre Hunter? It's almost like how do we figure out how to you know slide Devin Hall into DeAndre Hunter role and then get Nigel Johnson to play more like you know what Devin Hall does in those other fifteen or twenty minutes we're going to miss from him. All that said, yeah, I think we I think we can do it. And, you know, UVA fans then, even before DeAndre Hunter went down, okay, gosh, we have to play Arizona or Kentucky. Well, one, we only have to play one of them. It's not a triple threat match. You know, they're, they're not going to come out with a briefcase if the winner gets to play us. You know, we have to play, uh, you know, they, they get to challenge the winner afterwards and, and, and you know, get, a, get a sneaky thing like that. We only play one of them. This year's Kentucky team is, is not as talented as past. It's a brand name more this year than it is. I mean, I, they both have tough first-round games. Uh, Arizona only beat one, what was it, one top 50 RPI team after November 29th or something like that. You know, they haven't played a tough schedule. Aiden is a tough, he's a beast. He may be better than Marvin Bagley, who is the best player in college basketball. So he may be the best player in college basketball. Um, Jack Salt's got a guard man. You know, that doesn't seem fair on paper, but Jack Salt, you know, held his own against a lot of guys this year. So um, if they get there, if those two teams get – one of those two teams gets there, we got to play them. Cincinnati in the final. Uh, Cincinnati, if they get that far, they're the number two seed in our region. They like to ugly it up like we did. So, you know, we don't have the – it would have been an advantage to have Hunter, but it's not a disadvantage not to have Hunter against a team that plays the way we do. We still have better athletes than that guy. So, yeah, I think we get there. Uh, you know, and then you're in, in the final four is matchups. You know, I think we're slotted with Carolina or Xavier's region. Um, and the other side is is Duke, Michigan State, or well, Villanova. Uh, or Kansas, I think, in that region. Yeah. And Villanova at the top. All right. Yeah. You know, to me, I still say it's 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 what Virginia's done defensively is not going to change with Hunter being out. They're still going to be. They're, they're still historically in the KenPom.com era, which dates back to 2001. This is the best defense ever rated in the KenPom.com era. That doesn't change. It's can we score enough points? Um, and we don't need to score 80. We just need to score 60. I think we can still do that. You making any trips to Charlotte, to Atlanta, to San Antonio? Are you watching from the comforts of Waynesboro, Virginia? What's on deck for the AFP? We're leaving early tomorrow for Charlotte. The game is not until 9.30, but we're leaving early in the morning for Charlotte. So we maybe sneak and get a chance to see uh, – Scott German's going with me uh, – so we can maybe see Carolina's afternoon game, uh, and we'll stay through Sunday, assuming. You know, you know, I don't think I'm assuming a lot that there will be a win Friday night. Uh, and then, you know, next week, uh, Atlanta's Thursday, Saturday. Uh, one thing I'll say about the yeah, – I mean, we're planning, we're planning to, to make the trek down to Atlanta as well. You know, one thing I'll say about this is I don't know how it translates on TV, uh, but having been to NCAA tournament games and then having been to as far as a Sweet 16 game uh, as, a, as an observer – from courtside, the intensity of those games. Last week's games were intense because some of those teams needed to, to win to maybe secure a bid to the NCAA tournament. Or if you're Virginia or Duke or Carolina, you're trying to enhance your, your seeding. Uh, but starting, it's already started, but for Virginia starting tomorrow night, um, when they throw that ball up in the air, it doesn't matter if you're a 1 or a 16 or whatever number you are. you got to win the game. Kansas saw it today. They were down 10 in the first half. I'm sure their buttholes got tight. I was there courtside when Coastal Carolina had a 10-point lead late in the first half against Virginia, a five-point lead at the half. Virginia didn't really take control of that game until about 10 minutes to go. It's intense. I mean, I, I wrote a column about this this week, but 
you know, that group of guys, that 2014 group, was Joe Harris, Malcolm Brogdon, Leonard Perantis, Anthony Gill, the coolest customers I've ever met. All four of those guys, but nothing phases them. Under four timeout, down 10 points to Coastal Carolina. They come out of their – Tony's already done whatever Tony's doing in the huddle. They come out. They're waiting for the long TV timeout to end. I'm, I'm sitting probably 10 feet from them because where they're setting up and like where I am courtside, I'm right there. Those guys are yelling at each other. They never yelled at anybody. They're yelling at each other. I mean, you know, animated, getting in each other's face about something. I, you know, couldn't tell what, but you could tell it was because they're down 10 with four minutes going to the first half to the number 16 seed. Those games get really, really, really intense, nervous, everything else. So um, it's a different world. And, and being there and, and, and feeling that in person um, really changed me. So, yeah, now that I've gotten it, – it's, it's like a drug, you know. Uh, so that's why we're trekking down to Charlotte and trekking down to Atlanta, hopefully, and then hopefully San Antonio, because um, it's, it's different than it is on TV. So, yeah, for me, fortunately, I get to be able to do that and hopefully relate some of that to you folks back home. But, um, yeah, man, I tell you what uh, – there's a lot of nervous guys out there, uh, and they don't want to admit it, but they are. Well, you got me all excited, so I'm going to wrap up this podcast so I can run home and watch the uh, second half of games on this Thursday evening. Always a pleasure wrapping with AFP editor Chris Graham. I am Jeff Fife, and uh, you guys have a fantastic weekend.